for a sister chapter to the Ark of Loudoun. There are 24, 25 chapters in Virginia at this point with our uh, state chapter in Richmond. Every, I don't know, I missed what Eileen was taught that she told you about the arcs, but every arc does things a little differently. There are about 660 chapters nationwide, so we all follow the mission statement of the arc, the national organization, which is to advocate for the uh, civil rights or human rights of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and to see them in community, in the community as opposed to in institutions, so integrated in the community. And then every arc chapter, creates programs based on their footprint. So Loudoun County, that's the Loudoun County footprint. The Ark of Northern Virginia is Alexandria, Arlington, Falls Church, and Fairfax. The Special Needs Trust Program, though, come on in. The Special Needs Trust Program is all, we serve all of Virginia, all of Maryland and Washington, D.C. We also have trust in other parts of the United States. We have clients who have moved away. And so we're managing those trusts for them, even though they're in Colorado or Pennsylvania or New Jersey or wherever. There are some arcs that have multi-million dollar budgets, and there are other arcs that have one volunteer that's running the arc. So it's very different everywhere you go. And the level of expertise varies as well. Some may focus on children, some may focus on adults. We, we our arcs focus on any age, across, you know, from womb to tomb, basically. Um, our Special Needs Trust Program is the only arc in our region. So that's why I'm here today talking to you. The Ark of Loudoun does not have a Special Needs Trust Program, or the Ark of um, Prince George's County in Maryland doesn't have a Special Needs Trust Program. We manage the Special Needs Trust Program for Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. And I repeat that because people inevitably come back to me and say, well, we're in Loudoun. Can we write a trust with you in Fairfax? I say, yes, because we serve all of Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. So our ARC has DD waiver case management as well. We have a transition um, educational program for parents and students. We have created two apps, TravelMate and EmployMate, that you're um, welcome to use. And we're in the process, we meaning my colleagues, are in the process of creating another, <coughs> another app to help people with disabilities navigate. I don't know if it's a social app. I can't remember what, what the next one is going to be, but they have a whole plan and have gotten several grants um, to fund the creation of these apps. We also have a guardianship of last resort program at the Ark of Northern Virginia and then events and things as well. But we don't do parties. We don't do all the fun stuff that the Ark of Loud is doing. We don't have dances and parties and yoga and stuff like that. We do have a People First, which is for young adults. It's a Toastmasters group, the Ga I think they're called the Gavels, I can't remember, it's the younger group, they have a different name. And then we have a Toastmasters group for um, older adults with disabilities. So even though the, the ARCs serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities primarily, a lot of the people with ID or DD also have other diagnoses, whether it's physical or mental. And so they're also the population we serve. Under the trust program, we serve any disability. So we don't discriminate, it's any disability, no matter what, and again, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. I'm going to talk about special needs trusts um, in general, and I'll talk about the special needs trust program that we manage as well, and about our trustee. And that's all my contact information, by the way. I do Trust Talk Tuesdays in, at our Falls Church office, and you're welcome to join us. It's a small facilitated round table, people RSVP, and then I talk a little bit about trusts, and people then ask me any question they may have, whether it's Social Security or Medicaid or housing or whatever. So I'm there to answer any of those questions. Uh, I also do private consultations. So right before this, I was actually establishing a trust with a family. So Eileen graciously schedules those usually for me whenever there are you know, people from her area. <coughs> And it's on the third Thursday, or whenever we're having one of these sessions, that I'll come prior to, and oftentimes stay after, but today I have to go to the Ark of the Great <coughs> Swing for another thing. So, so there's a way to talk to me for free. So it's free information that I provide you, whether it's a Trust Talk Tuesday or a consult and or a consultation. And on our, our Trust website, 
And I noticed on my business card, and those of you that did get orange packets, my assistant was supposed to make more and she didn't, it seems. But <laughs> the website doesn't have a .org at the end of it. So it's theartofnovatrust.org. But on there, there are also webinars and documents and more information about special needs trusts. And feel free to take any of those Freddie Mac notebooks. We have many, many, many of those at the office. So what we'll talk about today is special needs trusts, how our ARC program, the trust program works. We'll talk about dispersing. We'll talk about the advocate program we have at the ARC. Special needs trust fees, because that's always a question, right? As well as ABLE accounts. And we have till 12 o'clock. So I can take questions, but I'll stop you at some point probably and move on if I see that we're getting too bogged down in things to make sure we get through the PowerPoint. But also have time because I know it's really important to answer things immediately because five slides later you'll we'll forget what it was you wanted to ask. <coughs> So there are six things to consider when planning for the future, and all of these are actually two other presentations. So I'm just going to name them and give you a brief definition of what they are. So one of those things is a letter of intent. We call it a trust plan. If you put a letter of intent in your search engine, you're going to get one million hits on letter of intent and te templates for that. Basically, a letter of intent is written by the primary caregivers usually the parents, about the child, the individual with disabilities, and I say child no matter what age, right? It could be an adult child. And their likes and their dislikes, the past, the present, and the future. You talk about employment, education, housing, recreation, spiritual, medical, who advocates for them, a list of their primary caregivers, it's a long document, it could be a long document. We have one page, a one page letter of intent from one family, and we have a 62 page letter of intent from another family, and then everything in between. Well, yeah. So it, it varies on how much you put into it, right? And you own that document, it's a guidance document, so you can change it at any given time. But wherever you have a trust, whether you have it with the Ark of Northern Virginia, or if you've written one privately with an attorney, and you have successor trustees on a special needs trust, They'll want a copy of that letter of intent so that they know what the expectations are, they know who this person is, they know what doesn't work for them as well as the things that do work for them so that whenever they go to the movies they know not to take them to a 3D movie because the individual gets massive headaches, instead take them to a regular movie or don't wear the color red because then they flip out, you know, have a meltdown. So that letter of intent is really important to have. Yes. Can you update the letter of intent once it's originally been written? Yes, at any given time, you own it. You can add addendums to it or something yep, like that? Yep, you delete, you update it, and you make sure that that copy is together with your will, your trust, and any other important legal documents, although it's a guidance document. And you also share it with, say, siblings of the individual with disabilities, or aunts or uncles or friends or whomever may be involved in that person's life when you're no longer around. You just make sure that when you update it, you give everybody an updated copy. And the recommendation is to do it around the individual's birthday. I haven't done either for my, I have two kids with disabilities, 19 and 24. I still haven't written their letters of intent. This is the one thing I haven't done yet. It's very daunting, right? Because I think I have to write the entire document at once, but you don't. Just write a little bit at a time. Legal authority, this is when we talk about um, legal authority in the individual. So whenever they're minors, you're, the, you're their guardians. At 18, they reach age of majority. And at that point, or any time thereafter, you can choose to either do nothing and they can make their own decisions, or you support them in their decision making. You could get powers of attorney, and you have a medical power of attorney for them, financial power of attorney, durable power of attorney. They're different legal documents that give you the right to interact with their healthcare professionals or make financial decisions with them for them, okay? That's it. And then the third thing is the guardianship and or conservatorship, which is a legal process in front of a court, usually with attorneys involved, and an order comes out of it, and that can only be changed if you go back to court. Powers of attorney can be revoked and rewritten. Yes? So if you have guardianship, it's one of those three, is what you're saying? Or well, it depends. If you have full guardianship, it's full guardianship. <coughs> if you have limited guardianship that says, um, 
uh, he cannot, he's incapacitated and cannot sign contracts, um, drive a car, or make medical decisions, but he can choose where he wishes to live, whom he wishes to marry, and he can vote and carry firearms. Mm -hmm. Well, you could potentially have a power of attorney to cover these other things, okay. right? So it depends. If it's full guardianship, it takes, it's all, it's the civil rights that are stripped from the individual. So you can have a combination. Okay. Government benefits, when we talk about government benefits, we're talking about means tested, meaning how much money does the individual have? Medicaid, Medicaid waiver, supplemental security income, food stamps, energy assistance. Those are all benefits that are provided unless the government's in the situation it's in today and they, are, uh, they lose them. Um, but otherwise, those are benefits that are provided through the government, and they decide whether or not the individual is going to get them once they know what assets and resources the person has. Okay. Yes? Now, if the, if the person's a child under 18, it, it doesn't go by the parent's income or the parent's assets? It's if it's a, a Medicaid child. waiver, it goes by the individual's assets and resources. <clears throat> if it's state plan Medicaid, Supplemental security income, it goes by the family. Okay. All right. Same as food stamps and energy assistance. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The other government <clears throat> benefits, such as Social Security disability, survivorship, retirement, and Medicare, those are entitlements. And so that's, we don't look at those as means tested benefits. So the government doesn't say, oh, you have $50,000 in an account, so you can't have an SSD. They don't say that because you paid into Social Security. And so you do get the Social Security. Yes? I'm a little uh, confused when you say means tested. The, what means what assets and resources the individual has, or what assets and resources the family has, depending on what you're applying for and how old the individual is. So what means, what assets and resources? A person can have a car, a person can have a place to live, a person can have the contents of their home, whatever that domicile is, that's all allowable. They're not going to look at that. But if they have a second car, that second car is now an asset. Or if they have a truck, right, a second motor vehicle, that's now an asset. And that would count as asset. Again, these are two-hour presentations, and we have a whole list that we're looking at for the upcoming year of, of what other presentations will be held here. Estate planning. This is where you're working with an attorney, preferably an elder law attorney specializing in special needs in Virginia, uh, who would help you write your will, your maybe advanced medical directive, so what happens if, if I'm on life support, what do I want to happen to me, write an advanced medical directive, any powers of attorney, financial, durable. So when I was married, my husband and I each had a power, power of attorney for one another. So he was out of the country, I could sell the car, even though it was in his name, because I could present that power of attorney. It's important to have that so that you can act on behalf of your spouse or partner or whomever. Once I was divorced, then I went to a very good friend of mine who became my power of attorney instead. And then I have backups if she's unavailable. So that's to protect you. The estate plan is protecting you, looking at your assets, and how, whenever you pass away, you want them divided. And whether you're going to have a will and a revocable trust of your own where you have your assets. So again, complicated to our presentation. But it's a, these are all the things that we need to be considering as we're planning for our future as well as that third and potentially, like in my situation, fourth person, right? I have, well actually it's still three because my husband's gone on exit. <laughs> but, you know, there's multiple people we're planning for. We're not just planning for our own retirement in the estate planning process, we're planning for our child with disabilities life as well. Financial planning, so you want to talk to somebody who's well first, preferably in special needs and financial planning. Um, not only an insurance agent who's, in, who's selling an insurance products, although those are very important as well, but who can also look at all of your assets and help you decide whether or not you've invested where you need to be investing, you need an additional product, or you're covered, what you can roll over, etc. So we, I don't know if you've spoken to Courtney lately, but we met with um, Courtney Haykoop, who 
I was very impressed with. She was one of the few financial planners I met with that I felt comfortable with. And it's really important when you talk to somebody that you're feeling, you know, you feel good about them when you're talking to them. And she's local. And then special needs trust, which is what we're going to talk about now. So who's eligible for a special needs trust? It's anyone with a physical, mental, or intellectual disability as defined by the Social Security Act. So that's very broad. Right? I have people come to me and say, well, my child doesn't have a diagnosis, but he's in the process. Would he still be eligible for a special needs trust? Yes, because we're pretty sure that the parents have a good idea of what's going on, and they're just waiting to get that diagnosis. Or we have clients who have trusts where the individual would have a mental health diagnosis, but claims that they do not have a disability, and nobody can force that adult to go to a doctor to be identified as having one. So we're going to talk about how can you leave money, <clears throat> how can we leave money for our children and not jeopardize any benefits because if we've worked hard to get them Medicaid and a Medicaid waiver, supplemental security income, we don't want them to lose that. So we're going to talk about how we can protect those benefits. <coughs> and how many of you know what a Medicaid waiver is? Okay, good. A good number, yeah, kind of. Okay. So Medicaid waiver is a, is a, vehicle offer, every state has a different Medicaid waiver system. So Virginia, I don't know if we're down to four or five right now because we've had redesigns, but the waiver um, allows the individual with disabilities to continue living in the community and receive <coughs> services in the community. For example, the community living waiver, which is one of the developmental disability waivers, has housing, um, residential supports, assistive technology, environmental modifications, care attendance, just a variety of services that are paid through by Medicaid, paid for by Medicaid to provide care. So when a person does have a, a, a Medicaid waiver, depending on the services, that's really going to lessen the financial burden on the parent. So instead of having $6 million to provide for my two children for the rest of their lives, which I don't have, Maybe I will have one day, but I don't have today. That because they have the Medicaid waivers, that's now lessened my financial burden because I know they'll have housing, I know they'll have food through Social Security, um, I'll know that they'll have medical care, they'll have attendance, they'll have job supports and things like that. So it come, becomes a question of what can I afford to leave them? Because I need to think of myself, not to the individual, and know how to disperse from a special needs trust. Who's going to advocate when we're gone? That's huge. Who's going to manage the money and who's going to advocate for the child? Those are two big questions. And when is an ABLE account used in addition to a special needs trust? So what is a special needs trust? It's a legal vehicle that's meant to provide benefit to and protect the assets of the individual with disabilities and still allow them to qualify for and receive government benefits. So if you, how many of you have children under 18? How many of you have children that are 17? Okay, and then everybody else, kids over 18, or is everybody family members, anybody a provider here? All family members, okay. So, <clears throat> When you have children that are under 18, they may have even older. If, if the person with disabilities has assets in their name and you're going, and they're now turned 18 in one month and you want to apply for Social Security, but they have $10,000 in a checking account, you can move the money into a special needs trust. It's a legal move of the money and then apply for the benefits. So when you call Social Security, they may say, oh, there's $10,000, come back when that money's spent. But that's not true. That can go into a special needs trust and then you can apply for, for, for any of those benefits. So it's important to know when you can move money, what money can be moved, what counts, what doesn't count as an asset and resource. So the main reason that people establish it is to protect those government benefits. I don't want my daughters losing their Medicaid waivers. I want them to keep those, so I make sure that they have no money in their name, no substantial, anything under $2,000 they can have. I don't want them to have more than $2,000 in their name. They can have a million in a special needs trust. That doesn't count. As long as, it's the asset, as long as the distributions are made correctly, that's not going to count against them. 
but they have to have less than $2,000 that they can directly access and get a hold of in order to, to keep those benefits. So we want to protect those benefits. A special needs trust is also used for money management and long-term financial planning. So we have individuals that have Social Security Disability and Medicare. So remember I said those are entitlements. Those aren't means tested. So either they work and paid into Social Security and are now getting disability, or their parents worked and the individual with disabilities was diagnosed before 22 with a disability and so they can piggyback on their parents' Social Security. So that's an entitlement, and that and Medicare, but they can't manage their money. The parent knows that, okay, they're never going to have a, a Medicaid waiver because they're too high-functioning, they're too, too capable in many ways to get that DD waiver because they don't have a developmental disability. It's mental health, for example. But if I leave them $50,000 or $500,000, that's not going to be good. It's either going to be spent immediately, somebody's going to spend it for them, they're going to gamble it away, they're going to lose it, something's going to happen. So that's another reason why people establish special needs trusts, is to protect the money so that the individual doesn't use it all or isn't taken advantage of. And then to promote the dignity, comfort, and happiness of the person with disabilities. Government benefits are not large amounts of money, right? So it's enough for room and board, so if my daughters have supplemental security income, so that's for room and board primarily, and Medicaid waivers. So that covers the basics, but if they wanted to go on vacation to Disney, the government's not going to pay for vacation to Disney. The special needs trust can pay for vacation to Disney, but that's not going to do it. But that's part of that dignity, comfort, and happiness, the things they like, or dental care. Over 21, unless there's dental insurance, there's no government benefit that's covering dental care to the extent that our kids will need it. You know, anybody needs it. It's the basics that they'll cover. So that's part of the calculation, and that's part of the things that a trust pays for going bowling. You know, it can cover, it can pay for a lot of different things. Anything the benefits pay for, we let the benefits pay for, and then the trust can pay for anything else. So what types of trusts are there? There are two types of special needs trusts. There are third party special needs trusts, and there are first party special needs trusts. And we're going to talk about both of them. The third party special needs trust is what we establish as parents or family members. And the trust I have for my girls will be funded when I die, or when their dad dies, whoever dies first. Now that we're divorced, it's changed. If you're still married, it's usually the second to die of both parents. So right now, well, actually, my one daughter's is funded, and the other's unfunded. But the intent is to fund it whenever we're gone, right? So you can set up a trust, but you don't have to put money into it. You can either establish it with an attorney, or you can establish it with a nonprofit that's been authorized to manage. And I'll talk more about these on other slides. In the first party trust, you can establish that so the parents, the grandparents, the individual with disabilities, if they're over 18, the court, or a guardian may establish a first party or self-funded trust. You can either do it with an attorney or with a nonprofit. And that's what the pool, they call that pool trust when it's a nonprofit. Excuse me. Are there tax advantages when you fund it? So if you were no. to no. <laughs> okay. No, it's not on a special needs trust. Okay. So third party trust, what we call family funded trust. So if you have the packet in there, there's a packet with third party information or family funded as well as self funded. So who establishes this trust? It's usually the parents, yes. I'm sorry, is it possible to have more than one special needs trust for yes. the same child? Okay. Yes. When you have like a divorce situation, two separate parents have just done. Yep, you can have 17 special needs trusts if you will. Okay. Good luck managing it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And if that child's savvy, they'll be like, hey, mom, I need my kids. Hey, dad, I need my kids. Hey, I'm from Joe. So, so either it's the parents, it's usually the parents, the relatives. We have a couple of trusts that have been established by friends and neighbors of a person with disabilities and funded that. So anybody may establish this third party or family funded trust, just not the person with disabilities. When it comes to funding, yes. When the, if, it, if you have a third party trust can you move is established by a separate attorney can you move it to the nonprofit yes okay. yes so you have a third party trust and then, then the question is 
where does the money come from? So when somebody wants to establish a trust with the Ark of Northern Virginia, we sit down, we have all the documents, you can see them in there, they're online. My first question is, from where is the money coming? Whose money is going into the trust? This is anybody's money in a family funded trust, just not the person with disabilities. Anybody may contribute to the family funded, just not the person with disabilities. Huh? So if you want to establish it with the heart, you can Yes. So none of these other trusts can take money after death? Yes. So they can all take money after death. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, where's the money coming from? Is it coming from the family or is it coming from the individual? Family funded, self funded. It's important to keep them separate, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But you never commingle the money. Kid Joe, money goes in Kid Joe's self funded trust. Parent Mary and Bob, they go, it goes into the family funded. Yes. If you, if if the child is going to receive an inheritance, does that money? And right now, it just goes directly to the child. Can the child put it in the trust if they get an inheritance? It goes into the self-funded trust. Anything that is left directly to the child uh -huh. goes into the self-funded trust. Okay. So you have to go back and change it. If you're able, to, if you own those documents, right? Then you go back and change it, and you name the special needs trust for the benefit of. But if it's grandma and grandpa that are 92 and 94 and they don't want to change any documents and, you know, they're too old and it's a too... My dad was like, oh, you guys take care when I die. It's like, no, dad, please. <laughs> Let's take care of this now. If you can get them, if you know that, that your mom's leaving money to your child, go back and have them change that document so that it gets left to the special needs trust for their benefit. This is an old trust that can't be changed. Oh, yeah, then it's, yeah, then it's going to be over here. If it's the individual, it's the individual. I have a, somebody has property, for example, and it's a generational thing, and five generations of the family have to inherit that property, which means that the fifth generation in this scenario is an individual with disabilities receiving means-tested benefits, Medicaid waiver, SSI, and it's an irrevocable trust. That's the situation. Yeah, so okay. we're so we're working to figure out what we can do. Is there any way? So you could potentially go to court and ask the court to change that. That's a potentiality. So sometimes trusts were written back in the day, and 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 a um, an attorney can argue that the intent for the parent or the intent of the grandparent or the intent of whomever was to take care of it. And had they known about special needs trust, then it would have gone to. And sometimes. Many times the court will allow that, but you have to get it ordered, court ordered. You can't just do it. So, if you want to establish a trust, you either come to the Ark of Northern Virginia, or to here, we can sit and do it here, or wherever we meet, and establish the trust, or you go to an elder law attorney, or you go to a financial institution. Those are the three places where you would establish a special needs trust. Financial institutions are really getting out of the business of managing special needs trusts unless they're millions of dollars. They have very high minimums, a lot of the financial institutions, because it's a lot of work and they don't want to do it. Usually it's funded, so when to fund it, usually it's second to die, but you can fund it prior to. So with our special needs trust, our minimum is $250. If you don't put $250 in our trust, then one year after you establish it, we invoice you for $65. And every year after that, we call it an annual maintenance fee. We're keeping in touch with you and whatnot. But at any given time, you can put $250 into our trust and you don't pay that renewal fee, so to speak. So that's called seed money. That gives the, the trust a tax ID number and you can use that on your documents. But you don't have to fund it until you die if you don't want to. So my one daughter is funded, the other one's unfunded. Inheritance, so how's it funded? It's usually funded through an inheritance, a life insurance policy, a transfer from another trust, contributions, real property, real estate, you know, mining rights, whatever. That's how they're usually funded, and it's where the trust is named. So our trust is where it's the foundation of the Ark of Northern Virginia, personal support, family funded trust, for the benefit of. It's a super long name, right? But in, every, in your will, there's a paragraph that the, your attorney would plug into your will that directs that money to the special needs trust. If you have your own family trust, it's plug in the paragraph so that it directs it to the special needs trust. Anywhere where you have a beneficiary designation, life insurance policy, any retirement accounts, 
TSP, <coughs> 401k, 403b, you name the special needs trust. So you want you go back and you make sure everything is getting going into that special needs trust. If you have a life insurance policy, let's say you have a second to die life insurance policy, you and your spouse, <coughs> then you name the special needs trust as the primary beneficiary because that means that when both parents are deceased, then that's going to be funding that. Let's say you have a policy, you just have a term policy, or one, another policy you have is a term policy, and you've named the other spouse or the other person as, as the beneficiary. And that's why you got that, and that was the intent. That's fine, but look at your contingent, your secondary and tertiary beneficiaries, because if you named your child, you go back and name what? Yeah. Uh, special needs trust, right? <laughs> Anywhere where your child is named, you go back and name the special needs trust. And even when you tell the insurance company to name the special needs trust, and they send you the document and say, okay, read it, because with ours, we had to go back and correct it twice, because they spelled the names wrong. The first time they... They called it the Sky and Sheridan Marsili special needs trust. Well, it's not. Sheridan has her trust and Sky has her trust. So they had to go back and change it. And then they spelled their names wrong. So we had to go back and change it again. So you just want to be aware of that. When you establish a trust with us, we're going to ask for copies of those documents showing that you've done what needed to get done to direct the assets to that third party or family fund of trust. And if you didn't catch that the spelling was wrong, we're going to catch it and say, hey, contact them again and let them know. If you already have policies in place and you've named your child, you can go on the website or contact your agent and ask them to give you a <coughs> beneficiary designation, change of beneficiary form, something along those lines. Different companies call it different things. And then you go back and change it and, and then make sure that's reflected. Our trust in home real estate, which is a question that came up a lot um, in Northern Virginia, can I put a condo in here, can I put my house in the trust, you can, rental properties can go in the trust. And then our trustee, which is Key Private Bank, they manage the property. If you don't have a property manager, they'll step in and get a property manager to manage it. And then what happens at the death of the beneficiary? So this is important. So when the individual passes away, the third party special needs trust or family funded trust remains open to pay for funeral, burial, cremation, donation to science, whatever you're doing when the individual passes. It can pay for estate taxes if things have to be paid for. And then it gets dispersed to whomever you've named as they're called final remainder beneficiaries. So when Sheridan passes away, or Skye, whoever goes first, if she has money in the trust, it's going to her other sister's trust. And then whenever the second, my second daughter passes, I've indicated who's to inherit at that point. So I totally control that. Okay? And that's important to remember because it's different with the self-funded. So on the self-funded trust, as I mentioned, the individual with disabilities, the parent, grandparent, guardian, or the court may establish that trust. You come directly to us to establish it. If the individual chooses to go to an attorney to establish it, they still have to have a trustee of the trust. They can't be their own trustee. The individual with disabilities can never be the trustee of their trust. Why do you establish the self-funded trust and when you only do it when necessary? This fund, family fund, if you're doing that as part of your estate plan and you're thinking ahead, I need to put a trust in place, I have to be able to protect their benefits, I need to direct the money here, I need to be doing this. The family funded, the self-funded, excuse me, is, oops, Uncle Joe died in Montana and he just left Billy $50,000. And Billy has a Medicaid waiver, or SSI, I need to move that money. So then Billy, if he's an adult, and, and he's capable, can establish the first part of your self-funded trust. Move it out of his name. They should move it in the month in which the funds are received, especially if they have any means-tested benefits. Because if they move it in that month they get it, it's not going to be counted as income or an asset. But if they hold on to it into the next month, it's now countable as an asset, and it will jeopardize the SSI and the Medicaid, the Medicaid waiver. And those, those services may be suspended until something happens with that money. 
So people get money unexpectedly through an inheritance because the, whoever wrote the document like that, it wasn't planned in advance. A lump sum payback from Social Security. We had an individual who, I talked to the agency, this person's living in a group home. I didn't know any of this was happening, right? So I thought, let me come and do a presentation to your staff so you know about, no, 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 we know all about trust. And I'll say, five months later, Tia, we don't know what to do, what? Joe got eight, all these people named Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Joe just got 80,000, got $80,000. We spent 40,000 of it on two cruises, new bedroom furniture, 22. Let's say he had Down syndrome, he didn't, but hypothetically. He should have switched to Social Security Disability Insurance when his parents retired, when one of the parents retired. Oh, but they've been dead for however many years. So they contacted Social Security, and that lump sum payback from Social Security was $80,000. 10 years of not getting the actual amount of benefits. So the gap between whatever the SSI was and the disability he should have been getting ended up being $80,000. That doesn't happen a lot, but that was a big chunk of money. So lump sum paybacks can be $10,000, it can be $20,000, it can be $2,000. Okay. A jury decision, so that's if somebody has an accident and they hire an attorney and it goes to court and the jury decides that that person is awarded $3 million for that accident that happened in the hospital. Or maybe a settlement came out of that instead. It didn't go to the jury, jury and they settled for a dollar a month. That would go into a first party trust if the individual with disabilities was the victim. It's their money. My point is I'm trying that I'm making is and when it's their money, it goes into a self-funded trust. It could be income, they could put their earnings into a self-funded trust. Adult child support. So if anybody's divorced and the children are under 18, doesn't matter, the child support doesn't count. Whenever they're 18, whether there's guardianship or not, or any other type of legal authority, if, that, if the parent is still paying child support for the adult child, that is not countable as income. And that could affect benefits. And it so, certainly will be accounted by Social Security Administration. So if anybody's divorced and is getting child support, will be getting adult child support, we can talk about that <clears throat> before you go to your attorney to have the documents amended. Because you want to have that money irrevocably assigned to a first party trust so that it, it doesn't count against their government benefits. Okay. And we have law in Virginia to, to support that. The law, Connor's law, I don't know if it's three or four years old now, and then just last year, maybe two years ago now, the judge can also determine what that dollar amount will be. Military survivor benefit, if anybody, is anybody military? Don't worry about that. Alimony can be assigned to a first party mm -hmm. trust if the individual wins the lottery and they have government benefits, that would have to go into a first party trust. So you see the difference? This is the individual's money, this is anybody else's money. Okay? And here's the other big difference. Family funded trust, you decide who inherits when the child passes away. Self funded, it's a Medicaid payback, or you can leave it to the Ark of Northern Virginia, or to the heirs of the individual's estate after Medicaid is paid. So my girls both have Medicaid waivers. They've had Medicaid for 11 years here. They had Medicaid in um, Florida when I first moved back to the state. So they have a Medicaid lien. It's probably a billion dollars each at this point, God knows, with operations and everything else. So if they had a first party trust, let's say my sister refused to change her documents and left everything to the girls directly, and I had to go in and establish first party trust. When they pass away, Medicaid has first dibs on the money in the trust. Unless I had Sheridan establish it, but she said I'm going to leave it to the argument of the Virginia's trust program, which she can do. So that's why you want to really go back and look at your documents and make sure everything is directed over here to the family mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if they never had Medicaid, then Medicaid gets nothing, right? So when a person passes away, we send the death certificate to the Department of Medical Assistance Services, which is Medicaid. And they write back and say the Medicaid lien is $342,624.59. It's down to the penny. And if there's $10,000 in the trust and they submit it to Medicaid, we send it the money to Medicaid. If they say leave it to the ARC, then we, we just write and say they left it to the ARC, and then we get the money. But there's no way out of it otherwise, unless one individual did not have 
Medicaid. He was he, he did the special needs trust. He moved his money into the trust. His insurance benefits had all run out. He was not getting any more anything paid for anymore. So the social worker at the hospital was applying for Medicaid for him. Established the trust. The money was in the trust. He said Medicaid payback, and then his two brothers. En route to the hot to another hospital, he died. So we sent the death certificate to Medicaid. There was no Medicaid lien because he never had Medicaid. So his brothers. Inherited. Yes. Is that for all trusts then? Self-funded only. Just self-funded. Just self-funded. When the because what the government is saying is, if I'm paying for your health insurance, I'm allowing you to put your money into a special needs trust, and I'm not going to count it. So you can use that for vacations and video games and whatever, and I'll continue paying your health insurance. But when you die, you owe it. Okay. So some people complain about that, but I say, look, you've had free health insurance for you know 70 years. It's a good thing. So yeah, for the family funded trust, you determine who inherits. Self funded, Medicaid, the ARC, or Medicaid and the heirs of the estate. This is about um, survivor benefits, so we don't have military, let's get that. So here's the chart. So where can we go to establish the trust? You can either go to the ARC in Northern Virginia where we manage the trust and Key Private Bank is our trustee. So they do what any trustee would do. So Many of these scenarios here, right? The trustee. What does a trustee do? A trustee of a trust, any trust, is responsible for asset management and asset allocation. Asset management and asset allocation. So they have to invest the money, keep an eye on the money, move the money around, whatever needs to happen so it's growing, preferably. They do the account reporting, tax reporting, check writing and dispersing. Those are the duties of a trustee. So we can't be the trustee and manage the funds? We can't, it's next. Yep, okay. yep. Sorry. It, it Sorry. But yeah, any yeah. trustee, this is what this yeah. trustee yeah. has to do. If you're the trustee, you're responsible for those five things. And when it's a special needs trust, you also know, have to understand social security rules if the individual has SSI, Medicaid rules if they have state plan Medicaid, or Medicaid waiver rules if they have the waiver. You have to know when you can disperse from the trust so that it doesn't jeopardize any of those means-tested benefits they have. It's important to understand that. Like we never give cash to an individual that has SSI because that's reportable to Social Security and we'll reduce the SSI. <coughs> we can give them a debit card and they can use the debit card to buy things and we get receipts as long as it's not room and board. So there's ways around it, right? So Key takes care of all of that. They hold the real estate and whatnot. And we're the day-to-day -day client contact. You work directly with us. The individual with disabilities works with us. The family members, the therapist, the dentist, the mechanic, whoever we're talking to. Or you can go to it in the private. So you can go to an attorney. Again, an elder law specializing in special needs. <coughs> Estate planning attorneys don't really know about special needs, and they'll tell you that. So it's an elder law specializing in special needs. And they write the special needs trust for you. So if you don't choose the ARC, you go there. And you're, it's usually the parents or the co-trustees, or you could be one. So co-trustees, and you really don't have any work because your tr the trust is unfunded. You're not going to fund it until you die. So they write up the documents. Who has work are the successor trustees because you have to name who will actually administer the trust whenever you're gone, right? So I, Robert and I, back in the day, we were in Florida. I worked in a disability world there. And I met an attorney, and she said, let's do all your documents. We're like, okay. So we did our wills, our powers of attorneys, advancement of directors, and special needs trusts for the girls. So that's how we set it up originally. And we were the co-trustees. No money in the trust. We didn't have any money. No money in the trust. And I named one of my sisters as the successor trustee, and then another sister after her. I'm the baby of the family, so they're 8 and 10 years older than I am. And each, and they continue to be eight and ten years old. You know? <laughs> so they're older, and they're not as healthy as they used to be, right? So whenever I moved, came to Northern Virginia, got the job at the Ark, I thought this is ridiculous. I'm asking these two to to manage a trust and administer a trust, and they're older. And you know, my one sister would be like, "Oh yeah, you can have that," and the other one would be, "Well, let's you know, they're two very different personalities. You have to think about that too." So anyway, so at that point we wrote the trust with the Ark in Northern Virginia and then revoked the other two trusts. They were unfunded so I could revoke them. 
But you, so you have to think about that. Who you name as successor trustees. Most, if not all, attorneys at this point will write into the document if the successor trustee, and you may have a whole line of them, is unwilling or unable to serve, they may transfer the trust, establish another trust we were asking about. So they can go to either the Ark of Northern Virginia or a financial institution if, the, if there's enough money in the trust and, and establish a trust there and then decant, then pour that money into the other trust. So you have to think of successor trustees. If you go to a financial institution, a lot of times it's the parents and the, and the bank that are, the, that are co-trustees and then the parents die and the bank takes over. Or maybe you named a successor trustee and it's that successor trustee mm -hmm. in the bank. But again, they're not so willing to take on special needs trusts and then they don't, they don't have the same knowledge basis as say the ARC or maybe a family member. Yeah, me it's always going to cost, so you can establish it with the ARC, with an attorney or a financial institution. It's always going to cost money to establish a trust. Unless you're in Pittsburgh and you establish it with the Chiva, the ARC there, they won't charge you to establish a trust because they have a gazillion dollars in their trust. <laughs> <laughs> So the attorney we charge, the attorney charges, the bank charges as well. With our and our fees are later on. So there's always going to, with us there's a management and a trustee fee because we're working for you to manage the trust. And the trustee is working to do their work. If you have a, if you're the trustee or you have successor trustees, you may charge, and I believe it's up to one percent as a trustee against the corpus of the trust. You can also outsource if you need a CPA to do the account reporting or the tax reporting or whatnot, so you outsource. So you may be paying fees to do that, or you may be doing it yourself. And then that doesn't cost. Um, and with the bank, they also have fees for admin and investment fees, etc. We're experts in the world of disabilities, and we're working with the bank. We're experts in the financial world, so you have a combination. And we chose to divide those responsibilities because we know what we do well and they know what they do well, so we collaborate together. When it's a private person, it depends. You don't, we don't know how well versed they're going to be. We know our kids well. We understand mostly the systems that they're involved in with the disability you know, um, systems that we have to navigate, whether it's Social Security or Medicaid. You know, we've learned a lot. But siblings may not have that same <clears throat> knowledge that you have. So either you have to share it with them or you have to make them aware that they can contact organizations like the ARCs to get more information and support. And then the bank, again, it depends on who's in the position of trust. Um, I forget what they're called, I'm drawing the blank. They're not trust man, they're with the bank, whatever their title is, <coughs> that are overseeing the trust and you go to them for disbursement. We've been around for 56 years, so there's no new reliability. Our trust has been in place since 1999. When you name a successor, that's why with the continuity with your private trust, make sure you have successors that are same age peers with the individual with disabilities. You don't want you know, siblings that are your age or older because eventually you'll die out and that person will be there without somebody that's the same age. So same age peers, and then with the bank, the banks are, you know, We've seen banks being bought and sold the last 10, 15 years, so the trust goes with the next bank, preferably, and hopefully it just follows whoever the trustee is there, whoever owns it. Can I ask yes. a question? So, um, I know technically this isn't a sales pitch or whatever, but for, for what, are, what are the, besides the continuity, which is great, and then the uh, nominal fee I saw up there too, yeah. a lot of us potentially, myself, I'll just talk about me, Money is an issue. So, mm -hmm. what are some benefits to go with the ARC as mm -hmm. opposed to doing the outsource? You know, that's other people right. listening. So, I actually have a slide later on. Okay, I'll I'll wait. That. <laughs> I'll wait. I'll wait. Okay. Let's keep on. Good. So, this okay. just happens to be the first page of the joiner agreement, so you know what it looks like with us. So, whenever it's whenever you write a trust with an attorney, it's all in one document. All the legalese and, and the names of people and the names of vehicles that are being used to fund it, etc. With the ARC, it's two separate documents. We have to have what's called a master agreement, which is all the legalese, and then a joinder agreement, which joins the master. Just give me a picture of that. Put that up there. So these are common mistakes that you wish to avoid, we should all avoid. 
One, bequeathing assets directly to the person with disabilities. So this is where you forget to change your will. Right? It's a common mistake. So that's why it's important to be working with an elder law attorney who specializes in special needs, who knows to write, when I die, whatever's left of my estate will be divided 50% between Sheridan's Trust and Scottish Trust. It has to be written in there, right? If you don't do it, Good. Or they name the person with the disability as the beneficiary. Remember, we have to change those beneficiary designations to name the third party special needs trust. So can we solve this problem then? <coughs> so we don't do we don't directly name the person with disability as a beneficiary to a life insurance? Correct. You name the special needs trust. Anywhere where your child is named. You take their name out and you name the special needs trust for their benefit. Whatever the name of the trust is, that's what you name it. So if you, what's your child's name? Z. So, so, his, so instead of naming him in the will, instead of saying 50% to his sister and 50% to him, 50% to his sister, 50% to the special needs, the Z special needs trust, mm -hmm. or whatever the name of the trust is. They never, their name, it's never their name, it's, it's a trust for their benefit. And that would be on like savings accounts and things like that too, right? With payable on debt, you've got to go and do all those too. Yep, right. yeah. And what we're finding out with payable on debt is the banks have, it's computerized now, and they won't take a name. So we have to, we have to get a tax ID number for the trust. Which is interesting. It's a it's like it's it's your you created the problem, but the bank the bankers don't know how to go in and change it. It's a computer program and has to change it. Blah, blah, blah. So yeah, anywhere where your child may potentially be named or may be a descendant that would inherit, you want to make sure that the trust is named or their name is removed. Like I'm taking them off of my my bank account or my checking account because I'm I'm, I'm assuming that whoever's my executor in my estate, they're going to be using whatever I have left in my checking to cover estate taxes and things like that. And then what's left, it will go into the will and then it goes in. So what can we do? If this happens, what can we do? Can we solve these problems? Can we correct these mistakes? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How? Uh, if it's within the same month, you can take care of it that way. If it's after that, you have to go through the court process. Then you don't have to go through the court. You can still move it after it's preferable that you move it in the month in which it's received, but if you don't do it, it may count as income. So you can do it at any given time. Okay. So what we normally do is if somebody says, oh God, they've been sitting with the check for three months, establish the trust, put the money in the trust, you let Social Security know, for example, and Medicaid, if they have SSI and Medicaid. And if they come back and say, oh wait, the new OS money, then we pay them. If they don't come back, but not a self-funded trust, right? Self-funded, what do you mean not a self-funded? Do, do a self-funded. That's you, the only thing that you can do. Okay. It's to the solve the problem. To, to solve, the, to solve the, these problems, the only thing you can do is the self-funded. Okay. Correct. Does that understand, you understand that? Yes, you say same month. Is it, you can establish the trust fairly quickly? And yes. Be fast 